It's good to be with you this afternoon, and thank you for your presence here today. I hope that um, what is shared today will be helpful to you. End-of-life care and making end-of-life decisions is something that's super important to me, um, particularly because I sit with many at the end of their lives. And I will tell you, just as I'm sure that each one of you have had opportunity to sit with loved ones at the end of their lives, I will tell you that if conversations and decisions have been made ahead of time, that beautiful, sacred time that you share at the end of someone's life is so much more sacred if conversations have been had about wishes, about medical decisions, about what that person wants or does not want. And if everyone, if all loved ones are involved and are on the same page. And so my hope today is that I'll share with you some resources that may be helpful, that I'll share with you some conversation starters and some motivation that might help you begin conversations among your own circle of loved ones. Because I am well aware, I live in my own family, you know, so I'm well aware that this is not an easy topic to broach, even as we have tried to talk about it in my family. We get as far as, I know we should be talking about this, and then the conversation ends. So hopefully I'll give you some helpful conversation starters and things to be talking about. And then lastly, we'll end with um, some ideas about how to begin planning your memorial service, your celebration of life, some things to be thinking about. So these are the three areas of preparation that we'll cover today. We're going to talk specifically about planning your advanced directive. This is separate from your most form. Your most form is, is just medical, okay? In an advanced directive, we're gonna, we are, I'm going to introduce you to um, the five wishes pamphlet. You may or may not be familiar with five wishes. I have one for each of you. And for those of you who are watching this either via live stream or a recording, I have extras in my office, so if you'd like to look at a Five Wishes document and see if you'd like to fill one out, you can certainly come to my office and I'll make one available to you. Um, I find Five Wishes to be helpful because it helps not only make medical decisions, it names a healthcare agent, it is a legal binding document, it helps us make spiritual decisions, it helps us sort through emotional decisions, as well as starting to plan our end of life. We're going to talk, as I said, about conversations that we need to be having with our loved ones. We'll do that. I'll introduce you by what we'll watch just a snippet of a Tool Guan Day is Being Mortal video. And then, as I said, um, I'll introduce you to some beginning planning for the celebration of your life. First, we'll dive into why you need an advanced directive. Oh, it's so hard to think about these things. None of us wants to think about um, being out of control and in a place where we can't make our own decisions. That is not a situation that any of us wants to imagine ourselves in. But we can probably, if we don't give it too much thought, we can probably imagine, we can probably think back to a time when we cared for someone that wasn't able to make all of their decisions for themselves. We can probably think about a situation 
or we knew of a situation when someone was in, in a sudden accident and lost some of their faculties about them and they needed decisions to be made on their behalf. We have to recognize the reality that this can happen to us too. We pray that it does not, but we are not immune to these things. So advanced directives allow us to guide important medical decisions if we're ever seriously ill. And this should be empowering to us. So if we have these medical decisions written down someplace in a legally binding document, then we still have made the decision. Those decisions have not been taken out of our hands. It's also important to recognize that our loved ones don't necessarily know what our decisions are. You know, I think a lot of us, myself included, take advantage. I think we make this assumption. I, again, I say myself included. I make this assumption. My family knows me. My husband knows me. My kids know me. Of course they know what I want. But in the heat of the moment, in the stress of the moment, in the crisis of the moment, to ask them to make that decision is a little unfair, a little unreasonable. And the reality is, I don't know if they really do know what I want in those given situations. So perhaps we can't make all those assumptions. An advanced directive empowers our loved ones and doctors to make the best decisions on our behalf. I love that word empowers. It empowers them. We empower our loved ones and our doctors to make good decisions on our behalf. We're helping them. It's a gift we give them. I think so many times we don't broach the topic of advanced directives because we think we are protecting our family from a topic they don't want to talk about. They don't want to think about us dying. So I love this word empowering. It flips it, you see. We're helping them. Helping them to know how to make the best decisions on our behalf. It avoids any disagreements about what to do. I have to tell you, as a clergy person standing around the bedside, this is a reality. If you don't already know this for yourself, this is truth. Disagreements happen. Family members disagree about what to do for mom and dad in their dying days. I don't want that to be you. And you don't want that to be your children. Help them. And finally, an advanced directive gives the gift of peace of mind to those who care about you. Not only about making medical care decisions for you, but it gives them the peace of mind in all sorts of ways, especially with the five wishes document. It gives them peace of mind that they are honoring your life in, in so many areas. So if you've ever wondered, if you've ever been on the other end of caregiving for someone who's actively dying and you thought, well, I don't really know what my loved one wants me to do. Filling out an advanced directive is giving the gift of peace to someone who's wondering, what should I do for you? 
This is a general link to, um, to the Office of the Attorney General for the State of Maryland for advanced directives, and I felt compelled to put this link in there just so you're aware. You can go to the Office of the Attorney General for the State of Maryland um, and get general help for advanced directives because I'm going to share with you the five wishes document, but I don't want to make you believe that that's the only resource out there. It's just one that I like. So five wishes. Before I pass this out, um, this advanced directive was created by the National Nonprofit Organization Aging with Dignity. It was created in 1996. It is a legal binding document. It is legal in the state of, it is a legal binding document in the state of Maryland. There are a few states where you have to take one additional step after this document is signed and witnessed. Um, but the state of Maryland is not one of those. So if you choose to fill out five wishes um, and have it witnessed, it, it will hold up um, and there are steps to follow. It was a collaborative effort between doctors, nurses, lawyers, and other experts in end-of-life care. That is why it addresses the personal, emotional, and spiritual needs of a person, not just the medical and legal ones. So that's, again, why I like this document so much, because it is really um, whole, it's a whole document. It's a whole person approach to end-of-life decision-making. So I'm going to pass this out to you, and we're going to look through it um, quickly together. So if you open it up, the first thing I'd like us to look at is wish one on page four. I just want to familiarize you a little bit with this, not that you can't look through it yourself more thoroughly later, but just to show you around a little bit. The first one is wish one. And the first wish you'll want to make, the first decision you'll want to make is the person I want to make health care decisions for me when I can't make them for myself. So you'll name, we will name our health care agents. And then there is an opportunity to name a second person and a third person if that person is not able to fulfill those responsibilities. Um, there are some tips about making um, how to choose those healthcare agents, and then on page five, um, what your healthcare agent can or cannot make decisions about, and you can cross those out. So it's a very user friendly document. You can see how. This does not use medical lingo and legal, legal lingo that is hard to understand or tricky in any way. It's something that you can go over um, by yourself and share with your family or your friends and loved ones. Um, but it's a thoughtful document that helps you begin. It, it really begins to get our thoughts going and our mental juices flowing about decisions that need to be made. If you flip the page, wish number two, 
My wish for the kind of medical treatment I want or don't want. So I think most of us think this is the only thing covered in an advanced directive. When really, for five wishes, this is only one of them. Um, but what's helpful about um, this document is that um, they give you many scenarios to contemplate on page seven. So they really spell it out for us and help us to begin to think through that process so that we're not generating these ideas ourselves, so that we're not afraid we might miss something. They're really leading us through it. If you flip the page, wish three, my wish for how comfortable I want to be. This has to do with pain management. It has to do with personal care. All those things. It has to do with dignity and how you want to be cared for, how you want to be... Um, how you want to be tended to religiously and spiritually. These are important things for people to know because it's not just about keeping you comfortably pain-wise. It's not just about clinical care. But there are other things to consider about how we want to be comfortable during our last days. What does that mean for you? What is involved in your comfort? I have often said to my husband, talk to me about what's going on. One of my fears is that I will be actively dying and the people around me will be in denial that it is happening. I fear that because I see that. And I have assured my husband that I will know what is happening. I will know what is happening because I trust my God that I will know what's happening. And if I know what's happening, I know myself enough that I will want to talk about it. That is in my five wishes document. Be brave enough to talk to me about it. I'm sorry if it makes you sad. Wish number four. My wish for how I want people to treat me. This is how... Also, so very helpful. Some people really want quiet. Some people really need to be left alone. Some people want soft music. Some people need visitors. Some people want visitation by chaplains or clergy. For some people, that's a painful reminder of a past that was hurtful. There are all kinds of things. Some people want to die in the home. And if that's a wish, it needs to be noted so that we can bring in hospice and make that possible. Wish number five. My wish for what I want my loved ones to know. I would invite each one of us to spend time in self-reflection with wish number five. It is a gift that we give to others. It is a gift that we leave with them. Wish number five. 
But it's also something because remember that five wishes is a document that we will eventually, while we're still cognitively able, while we are still active, it is a document that we will share with our family and our loved ones. So this is something that we will share now. And wish five should be completed when we share it. So imagine how wonderful to be able to share this good news of what you love about people and how grateful you are to them. What you want for them in your passing. Imagine that. How good that is. What a wonderful opportunity. So I share that with you. Again, I have some extra copies in my office. Um, and I, I can always get more if I run out. But that's just one. There are, again, I'm not pushing five wishes. It's just the one that I like. There are other options. What to do with five wishes? When and when? When should you fill it out? Now, right now. <laughs> right now, fill it out before you have a health crisis. When is it effective? This is an important distinction. You fill it out now, but when is it effective? It only takes effect when you are too ill to communicate. When, you're, when you cannot make your own decisions or you cannot speak for yourself. So don't be afraid, well, I can't sign it yet because somebody might take over for me. That's not how five wishes works. It's only when you're til too ill to communicate, cannot make your own decisions, or cannot speak for yourself. That's important to know. How to use five wishes. Review the document, hopefully with your family too. Fill it out in ink. I would suggest you do that after you review it a few times. Follow the directions for signing it. That's on the back page. There are really clear directions for signing it. There, there are two places for witnesses. It does not need to be notarized. Discuss it with your healthcare agent and doctor and give them each a copy. Make sure a copy of Five Wishes is placed in your medical file by your doctor. Discuss Five Wishes with your family and friends and give them a copy. So you don't only want a copy stuck in your file in your desk up in your office that you know, somebody may not have access to very easily, but you want to make sure that somebody close to you has it in their file where they can easily access it. There's also a little card that you can cut out in the back of this uh, Five Wishes that says, I have a Five Wishes document, and you can put that in your wallet. Okay? Um, there's tons of information on their website, fivewishes.org. It will answer all your questions. There's a great questions answers page. Next step, start talking. So that's all the stuff you, you get to do by yourself. So who to include in these good, important conversations? We can include family members, and by this I mean all family members. So like for instance, for my family, this includes my sister who is refusing to have this conversation currently. <laughs> so, so I'm gonna bribe her with something, I don't know. I know she likes crab cakes, I'm gonna find really good ones and we'll have a meal. Um, it'll be worth it. Um, close friends, if you have a close friend that's going to be intimately involved in your end-of-life care, um, involve that person or those people. 
your healthcare agent, certainly, your doctor, and any clergy or spiritual advisor who may be um, important to you. Make sure all these people, they don't have to be around the same table at the same time, but make sure they know your wishes. How to start the talk. Oh my gosh, this is so hard. Like, how do you start talking about this stuff? I mean, like, it's like the bombshell that ends the conversation and we're trying to start the conversation, right? These are just some ideas. You are an important person to me and I want you to know this. So val you're valuing the person who you're talking to. You're lifting them up. And you're showing them, hey, you are really significant in my life. And it is so important to me that you be involved in this. It's also prepping them that something important is coming. So open your ears. You could say something like, I've had a lot on my mind lately. Because probably if you've been thinking about this, it is a lot to have on our minds. I like this one. Since my last birthday, I've been thinking. <laughs> you know, it sort of, sort of leads into the, uh, you know, I am getting a little older. <laughs> um, and then, would you be part of some important decisions with me? Kind of a gentler approach. It would be really nice if you would be part of some important decisions with me. What to talk about when you have these conversations. You certainly want to talk about your advanced directive. You want to talk about what matters most to you at the end stages. And depending on what advanced directive you use, that may be included there. You want to talk about your fears and anxieties. And I would encourage you to write these things down. Just make some notes. Talk about your fears and your anxieties. I shared with you one of mine. My fear is that no one's going to talk to me about what's happening. Talk about your funeral planning or your memorial service, how you envision it, what it might be like. If you have ideas about that, if it's important to you, if it's not, share that too. It might not be. Offer your love and your thanks to that person. It's a good time to begin that. It's not saying goodbye. It's simply saying, I'm glad you're sitting with me and listening because you're important to me and I love you. And invite the opportunity for everyone to share. It's a good time to sit around the table and share love together. Recognize that we are all in this together. Every single person who sits around that table in this conversation is in it with you. No one is immune to mortality. <laughs> and no one is immune to recognizing the stress involved in the conversation. It's not easy. But trust the relationships you have with your loved ones. We're in this together. We're going to move to, um, to planning just to begin thinking about your memorial service. You know, I think sometimes we put this off. And we don't want to think about this because it really makes us feel like we're halfway in the ground. And um, most of us don't want to think about that. Most of us want to, be, want to be thinking about being full of life. Um, the reality is that at some point, all of us are going to pass. And whether you like it or not, somebody may decide to celebrate your life. Somebody may decide to have a memorial for you. And if you want any input on that, now is the time to say it. So the question to ask is, how do you want others to celebrate your life when you die? 
What kind of service do you want? Do you want a formal service? I always thought I wanted a formal service, and then I went to a church um, during COVID to deliver some supplies, and they had this outdoor chapel, and then they had a memorial garden where they could spread ashes, and I was like, oh my gosh, that would be so cool to have, <laughs> like cool, I mean, <laughs> way to talk about your funeral that way, but anyway, um, wouldn't that be beautiful if I had a memori my memorial service in that outdoor chapel, and then people could talk, could sing the song, we're walking in the light of God, to up through the woods, and then spread my ashes in the memorial garden. Now, of course, I'm not a member of that church, and I have nothing to do with that church, and I'll probably never be back to that church, so it's not going to happen, but, but it gave me an idea, you know? Um, what kind of service do you want? Do you have a church that you want to go back to? Do you have um, an arboretum that is very important to you? Do you have a park? Do you have a beach? Do you have a, um, a cemetery where your parents are? Do you want a funeral in a church that is an option or a synagogue? with communion, with hymns. If it's in a church, and if it's in a Christian church, do you want emphasis on baptismal promises, on resurrection, on the communion of saints? Important things to consider. Is that part of your identity as a child of God? Do you want it to be a coming home? Perhaps you're thinking about a celebration of life service where there's less liturgy, where there's more sharing of memories by family and friends. I would say this is more temp typical if the service takes place in a funeral home or if the service takes place in an outdoor setting, something a little less traditional than a church or a synagogue or a worship center. But not necessarily. You can still have people sharing memories and those kinds of things in a church service. Questions to ask yourself. Do you have favorite hymns or favorite songs that you want played? Is there a meaningful scripture? Do you have meaningful readings, meaningful poetry? Are there special people who may want to speak? Or are there special people who you want to speak? Maybe you want to ask them. Is there a special kind of music that's meaningful to you? I know people in my family who really want bagpipes played. Maybe another instrument is part of your tradition. Other things to consider. How do you want to incorporate what's important to you in your memorial service? I'm kind of thinking here of things that perhaps family members might contribute. What Do you have a grandchild who sings? Do you want that grandchild to sing? Do you have um, someone in your family or a dear friend who is an orator? Do you want someone to speak? Is there, you know, are there distinct people or are there distinct things that have been important to you that you want to that you want part of your service? Essential to remember, and I really want you to hear this. There is no prescribed way to celebrate one's life. Just hear me say that. The most meaningful memorial services are those which are personal. And I just have to tell you a quick story. When I was a pastor in a big downtown church in Frederick, Maryland, 
um, a, a State Farm agent. Um, he was a very popular State Farm agent in Frederick, died. And he, he was a young guy, and he had three beautiful children and a lovely wife, and they were super fun, tight family. And we were planning the funeral together, and they said, well, Pastor Stacy, the children told me, they said, Pastor Stacy, my dad wanted, played at his funeral, the song Love Shack. Because that, or he didn't say he wanted that song played at his funeral. He said, but we want that song played at his funeral by the B-52s. And if you, you probably don't know that song, but it is this alternative music, like bebop and does not belong in a funeral kind of music. And, um, and they said, we want that at his funeral because we sung that. That was our family, like that was our family song, The Love Shack by the B-52s. And I thought, okay, thank you. Um, so I was really trying to figure out how I was going to weave this in to the funeral service, knowing that this was a pretty prominent downtown Frederick church and, and that um, Larry was a pretty prominent um, State Farm agent in Frederick. And so I was very nervous about doing the funeral anyway. And, uh, and then I was going to play this really crazy song. So I wove it into my sermon. And uh, that Larry had been blessed to have a love shack here on earth. But certainly, you know where I'm going. The eternal love shack um, is much more complete than any love shack God might even provide here. Um, and, and, and thus the sermon went. But my point is this. The most meaningful memorial services are those which are personal. So even if you think you've got this off-the-wall idea, like playing the Love Shack by the B-52s, it will work because it is you. Be creative. Be you. Celebrate your own unique child of Godness. I encourage that. I encourage that. Your family will love that. The most helpful hint I can share with you about your memorial service planning, make some notes. Talk to your family and friends. Talk to your pastor, your rabbi, your spiritual advisor. And tell someone where these notes are. Please tell someone where these notes are. Um, you know, I recently found out my dad had notes, and I said, well, where are... He said, yeah, yeah, they're upstairs in my desk in the file. I'm like, well, when are you going to tell us that they're upstairs in the desk in the file? So tell somebody where they are. Conversations to be having right now as you begin this process. What is your life theme? What do you value? What's important to you? I didn't put this slide at the beginning, but it really is the beginning of this whole process. So the very first step of all of this are just some self-reflective questions. What is your life theme? What do you value? What is most important to you? Spend some time really getting to know yourself even a little more than you think you already do. And then you can dive in to all of this big, important, good, soulful work. How you live your life today is how you will be remembered tomorrow. And I'll leave you with this quote by Elizabeth Keebler Ross. It's only when we truly know and understand that we have a limited time on earth and that we have no way of knowing when our time is up that we begin to live each day to the fullest as if it was the only one we had. So 
Thanks for your time. Thank you for your attention. If you need extra copies of Five Wishes, if you have any questions, does anyone have any questions? I hope I did what I needed to do. So, um, But again, you know where my office is, so if I can be of any help. I have worked with a few residents to uh, begin, uh, well, more than a few, but uh, funeral planning and memorial service planning. So if you'd like any assistance with that, I'm certainly available. Thanks so much. Oh, Dick. This has been streamed? It has been. So we could get a copy of this to send to like a member of the family? You can, yes. It has been streamed. Um, you can find that today. It has been streamed, and then it will be recorded and Courtney, how can you get the recording? If you click on the emails that were sent this morning at 11 o'clock, it was the advertisement for this. It has the button to access the link to watch the video. They just have to wait about five, ten minutes. They can pull the little... Okay. We'll wait, for, wait for us to start, pretty much. Great. Thank you. Have a great afternoon.